You are looking at my dear friend, Pastor Susie. She is chilling this morning. Lots of chilling going on today, right, Suze? You check out the weather. Yesterday was kind of the same day. It's got that feel to it, doesn't it? This whole week sort of has that feel to it. Normally, she's running around. She's finding her toys. She's like, uh, yeah. Can we go back to bed? Anyway, here we are. There's the mm, Thursday morning shot of the sanctuary here at the Churchtown Church of God. I am not outside. Good morning, Xavier. Good morning, Scott. I am not outside for obvious reasons. What a week it has been. I mean, weird day. Was it? It was Monday, correct? And it was 90 degrees? Yeah, it was. I actually, like, or was it Tuesday? Monday. Did all the mowing in the morning and all of those things, and then it was supposed to... Oh, that was Tuesday. I can't remember. It's just been a crazy... It's not raining. Well, uh, it was raining here, so sorry. It's coming your way, I guess. We're a little south. Anyway, we're here in the sanctuary because it's freezing cold outside. <laughs> good morning, Connie. Good morning, Xavier. Good morning, Scott. Uh, good morning, Phyllis. Good morning, everybody. We do appreciate you checking in. You've seen this Susie Q here. She's my energy radar. And there you just saw another yawn from her. If energy is not in her, then it is not in the world. So here we are, everybody. Good morning, Barbara, my sister. How are you? I love following your posts. That's fun. Um, interesting things, interesting things going on. Interesting week, challenging week in many different ways, many different areas. You know, I mean, you live life, don't you? Sometimes we have challenging weeks that are very physically challenging. All of the different things that we have to get done Sometimes we're challenged with our schedules, and sometimes we're challenged by people. It's been a very um, sort of emotionally challenging week, spiritually challenging week. It's been one of those. So, um, and sometimes it's very interesting, I think, especially in pastoral vocation. You go into a week thinking, oh, well, here you go, Monday, to, Monday through Friday, here's my breakdown. Here's everything that I have to do, and it's, oh, it's looking good. I'll be able to do a little extra reading. I'll be able to do a little extra writing. I'll be able to do, and then whammy, 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 whammy. Um, and sometimes the whammies are awesome, and sometimes the whammies are, what's going on here? So it's been sort of a what's going on here, uh, sort of a week. Um, with you know, And that's all I can really say about it, but working through some things, making some adjustments. I do believe that they are, you know, as not to over spiritualize things, but I'm always talking on here about keeping your spiritual eyes open and what may be being conveyed through circumstance and through people and through words and through behaviors and, and through your prayer life and even some of the anxiety and angst that you might feel like what's happening. And so I think there are a couple of adjustments that I can make that can help out a little bit. And this was perhaps that period, you know, let this happen, I'm gonna bring this, I'm gonna show you this, and this could be a portent of things to come. Hey, Brett, hey, Jill, you know what I'm saying? And so you look, hey, Brenda, so you look and you, and you say, what's going on here in my life? And you don't just let it overwhelm you or upset you or defeat you in any way, but you look and you evaluate and you start asking questions. Do we not? Do we not talk about that all the time? Ask questions. Why is this being asked of me? What situation is this? What is it demonstrating to me? And so I think some adjustments are in order, and I'm going to make some adjustments. So that's where I have been. Hey, Jennifer, my sweet friend. At least you all bring such smiles to my face. I think of you guys all the time, and um, I pray over all of our quote-unquote regulars. And what really... Um, is really, really, really neat to me. First of all, um, 
You know, if you, I keep saying this, but if you just want to share this now, you can share it now. People can see it. I've made so many neat, new, interesting friends that have asked so many neat, new, interesting questions. Um, there are people all over the place that we talk about. Good morning, Jennifer, <laughs> preacher lady, uh, Barbara. Uh, it's so much fun. So go ahead, like it and share it and, and um, do all of those things that, that, we, that we do. And um, I so appreciate that. But what really is really neat is when somebody will just sort of offhandedly say, oh, and I like that thing that, that happens in the morning. Or you said something a couple of weeks ago, but I'm like, did you see that? Oh, yeah, I check in pretty regularly. And I, you know, then they watch... Um, TOL throughout the day, those sorts of things, and um, it's helpful. Your questions, our conversations here are helpful, and I, I just, that's why, you know, that's why. So I want to ask all of my pastor friends and, and you guys that are in the know in your churches, um, are you speaking about Pentecost this weekend? Are you speaking about Pentecost this weekend? I mean, is it... Are, are, you, uh, are you aware that there's going to be a, a Pentecost Sunday service of some sort of special celebration, a recognition? We have three level healing cover. Good. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can imagine he's looking forward. I don't know, he or she, um, uh, if they're indeed looking forward to it, or I don't know if you're being um, sarcastic about that, Xavier. I've heard a lot of that banter myself, and I love it. But uh, I did 25 years in, in the education system and all of those different things. I can, I can really relate. I've raised a couple of children myself. So um, anyway, have fun with that. Hey, Bill. Yeah, we're going to address it as well. You know, we're going, hey, happy Thursday. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. I'm glad because you guys are very witty and very funny um, and when you guys get going. <clears throat> that's where I want to be, you know, I want to talk about the Spirit the next couple of weeks, I have two weeks of preaching, and then I'm going on vacation for a week, which I'm not going to lie or be <laughs> in any way ashamed about, I'm ready for a vacation, um, and it's going to be nice, and we're going away, good morning, Dennis, um, so I've got two weeks, and I want to talk about the Spirit, now I don't necessarily, if, you know, forgive me if this sounds, yes, I know, Although, yes, I do. I was going to say, although you don't hear, you get the, all of your children except uh, Chelsea, I think. Um, well, you're the three, except Chelsea. Um, you really got to get to know. You know, once you know them and they begin to trust and talk, phew, the floodgates open. Chelsea just puts it out there. So, and so you, it's very, very interesting. Anyway. Uh, good morning, Kathy. I, like I said, our, I'm not going to preach a Acts 2 Day of Pentecost sermon. Um, I'm going to use that as part of our opening word and our understanding. But over the next course of the next two weeks, I really want to talk about the part of the New Covenant in the New Testament in which Holy Spirit, God, indwells us. So when we talk about the advent of Holy Spirit in the New Testament, and for what purpose? Purposes are stated. Did we not spend a great deal of time in 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 13, talking about gifts of the Spirit, talking about God indwelling us, God is love, and that core essence of love, without that, we're nothing. Right? That's the indwelling of Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so we talk about all kinds of gifts and abilities and the things that he can do for us. And therein lies the crux of a little bit of an issue as our thinking as intrinsically selfish human beings. That's not a knock. It is our nature as intrinsically selfish human beings, we begin to turn this relationship around in terms of what can you do for me? 
We have an example of that, if you recall, Simon the sorcerer in the New Testament sees the power, experiences the power of Holy Spirit and says, oh my goodness, I want that. And at first I think the apostles are like, yes, of course you want that. But he wants it so that he can do his parlor tricks and make some money and predict the future and do things of that nature. He wants it for selfish reasons. Now, even if we don't go there, we, are kind, we, we kind of are, are thinking sort of naturally comes around to, wow, I've got the power of God inside of me. How can that benefit me? Not in terms of living out the vision of Christ for me in my life, but how can that benefit me selfishly as a human being? Can I rise in church leadership? Can I utilize the power of the Holy Spirit to put myself on some sort of a pedestal, make myself better? Can I, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even, we'll take it down another notch. Take it down another notch to sort of everyday living. Well, if I've got the power of God inside of me, why am I struggling with this issue? Why do I have any financial difficulties? You begin to call upon God for everything that you want or need. Healing, money, restored relationships. Do that for me now. Now, those are all good things. Like, right, you know, you're, you're not thinking in selfish terms. Like, I want to be super duper rich. I want to be able to pay my electric bill, Lord. Lord. Well, I don't want to be burdened with this illness or this whatever. I want to have a restored relationship. Those are, but it is the generation of those prayers within our heart. So we've gone from simony down to the nuts and bolts of life. And so that's really what I want to talk about in terms of how a Christian, a submitted Christian, operates, so to speak, relates to Holy Spirit within them and what Scripture says about how Holy Spirit relates with us. See? So that's, that's what I want to talk about. I want to, you know, there's that whole theology of Holy Spirit presenting himself in, in, uh, in a brand new way on the day of Pentecost. This, you know, the, the spirit who is promised by Christ throughout the Gospels. John, uh, is it John 14? He, he literally says, it's better for me if I go because then Holy Spirit will come and boy, he will teach you all things in all truth. And you will, you will come to know me in such a greater capacity because of him, Right? Oh, there, yeah, I understand that as well. Did I ever tell you the story? And here's a sidebar, and we'll come back to the Holy Spirit. This is the power of, and I, I'm, I'm one of those people who pride myself in being in control of my mind and my emotions and all of those things. Okay, that being said, you know, I've had, I think, 13 knee surgeries. I've had nine, I think, on my right one, culminating in that last complete replacement. So it was a while ago, and I, I had an ACL reconstruction on my right knee. Now listen to the story, because this speaks to the power of the mind. I had an ACL construction on my right knee, probably the second one. And they gave me what's called a femoral block, where they stick this needle up in your crotch area. Okay, so if I would have known that from the start, that, that ain't happening, but it happened. And it went wrong. They, they normally wash one femoral nerve and it lasts for about 36 hours. You know, you could cut your leg off and you wouldn't feel it. Unbeknownst to them, they got right in the center, got both femoral nerves. So I went through the surgery and of course they, you come to and you, you do a couple of things, you get oriented and then they want to get that blood flowing. They want to get you up and that's you know, moving around. So I got up and hit the floor. I was paralyzed, and it was terrifying, as you can imagine. Uh, it's, it's, you know, one of the nightmares you have going into surgery, something's going to go horribly wrong. 
didn't know what was going on at the time. I am freaking out. I'm, I'm, you know, that moment of I am paralyzed now. This has gone wrong. So we got up, got in bed, all those things. The surgeon came, the anesthesiologist came and determined that this is what happened. You're going to have to lay in bed here in the hospital for a day or two and it'll come back to you. And it did. Fast forward another year, year and a half, and I tore cartilage in the same knee. I needed to go for a meniscectomy, which is a simple 45-minute arthroscopic procedure. You're down for a couple of days. You rehab for a couple of weeks. You're good to go. I know because I had a bunch of them. So it's simple. So I'm, I'm back in the hospital, and, and the day before, I developed this incredible sickness, incredible migraine headache. I couldn't think. I was sweating all the time. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm ill. There was no fever. There was just this horrible migraine. I get closer to the hospital and the anxiety is just pouring over me. Um, the doctor is questioning whether or not they're going to do the surgery, but they believe I just have a headache, all of those things. They pre-medicated me and that helped mask some of the pain, but the panic then set in. Uh, you know, I'm not thinking about relating this to what happened previously, but I start crying, I start screaming, I start reaching out to Kelly as they're wheeling me away, you know, how terrified I am, how afraid I am, all of these different things. And at that point in time, not knowing, now I've equated it since, but absolutely terrified and panicked with regard to what was about to happen. And I was that way back in the preoperative room. And they're like, what's wrong with him? What's wrong with him? And I'm just like, don't do this. Oh, my gosh. And they're like, lots of people have anxiety. I'm like, no, this is like my ninth surgery. I shouldn't, you know. So, power of the mind. Out of my control. And I needed to get that out. Then afterwards, I needed to recognize that's what was happening and, and, and figure that out. It was, man, it was crazy. Absolutely crazy. But you have that feeling when you don't know why all this stuff is pouring out of you, but I mean, your brain does. My brain was trying to protect me from doing this again. Like you almost got paralyzed once, don't do this again, you're dumb. And that's my, my, my brain is trying to do that for me. Crazy stuff. Hey Dale, <clears throat> that's my story. So. I like it. <laughs> I like it. It is crazy. It is crazy. So, you know, and, and we talk about that. And, and so here we are talking about life in the spirit. Life in the spirit. And, and here's a couple of things I want to talk about. Um, oh, they all they all went well afterwards. Like I said, uh, I kept on going. <laughs> so <laughs> I kept on going. I had after that I had another ACL reconstruction, another meniscectomy, and then we decided, so I had four ACLs in the right knee, I think three meniscectomies, um, and then there was a, like a lumpectomy, like, it, it, like the, uh, everything had worn and created this big lump on the side of my leg with all of this detrius that was in there. They took that out, and then finally I said, take the knee out, take it out, um, and so they did, and they gave me a new one, so... Working out so pretty well so far. A little shaky, but okay. Life in the spirit. We keep coming back to that. I keep coming back to that. Here's a couple of things. I want to challenge you to, to think, and you don't have to write all of this, but I do want the individuals who come across this this week to challenge themselves to think about how they think about Holy Spirit. Oftentimes, a couple of things happen. One, like I mentioned, we view Holy Spirit as, oh yeah, um, over the 20 years, four ACLs, saying six meniscectomies, a knee replacement, all those things. So I want to challenge you, right? That's exactly what I'm talking about, Jennifer. So hold on. How do you think about Holy Spirit? First of all, do you think of him as an object? Do you say, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit of God? Do you say him or do you say it? First challenge. You come across lots and lots of individuals who speak of it. 
And one of the reasons for that is we have an image of God the Father, do we not? An anthropomorphic vision. Human, we can equate God the Father. We have an image in our head of that God the Son in Jesus Christ. We've even depicted him. For right or for wrong, according to Scripture, we've even depicted him. Um, But the Holy Spirit, we have a tendency to objectify. So that's our first challenge. When we, well, what we know of the Trinitarian nature of our God is that he is three persons, one God. We, we went through 1 Corinthians last week with Paul teaching that, teaching that, teaching that. Many gifts, one spirit, one God. So that's the first challenge. How do you speak of Holy Spirit? And you'll even hear me say Holy Spirit instead of the Holy Spirit to try to be intentional to back myself away from objectifying Holy Spirit. Because once we objectify him to it, now he is a tool that we can use. Oh, the Holy Spirit, God gave me the Holy Spirit and I use it too. And so that's one of our first challenges. Okay? Oh, you're getting all these questions. We're going to talk about these over the next few days. Keep them coming, though. Structure the conversation over the next few days because all of these are very, very valuable. So that's the first challenge. How do you speak of Holy Spirit, which obviously is indicative of how you view Holy Spirit? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The second thing is, how do you understand Holy Spirit in worship? And this was an interesting conversation I had yesterday, was we have created sort of a Holy Spirit heresy in our churches. And you can see where I'm going with this. We've created a bit of a Holy Spirit heresy in our churches where we attempt as human beings, and we do, Well, we attempt, I don't know how he reacts to it all, but we attempt to create an artificial environment in which we believe Holy Spirit can thrive like he freaking needs our help. So we carve out, remember we talked about worship and carving out that 20 minutes of worship time and we'll lower the lights and we'll build the drama and we'll build the music and we'll do this and we'll we'll create this hyper-emotional environment and call it Holy Spirit time. He, Holy Spirit, was just speaking to me. Well, I've been in those situations and it's, there's little, if any, difference between that and the Rush concert I attended a couple of years ago. So is that a heresy in our churches that Holy Spirit is not in us, through us, And living in us and ministering through us, all of those things, is this Holy Spirit time. And look how the Spirit is operating. Okay, that's over. Now it's time to move on. So as we compartmentalize our thinking and objectify Holy Spirit in our individual lives, I guess what I'm saying is, do that we then carry that over into the corporate structure and objectify and view as utilitarian to our worship or a tool for our worship. We are now going to call upon you, Holy Spirit, to inject yourself in this worship. Okay, thank you. Moving on. Something to think about when we talk about Holy Spirit power in the churches. So again, I'm, I'm not... I'm not, I'm not falling in any one place. I'm hopefully asking questions that you as individuals, hey, Tom, and we as church ask. Because when we learn through Scripture that Holy Spirit is God, omnipotent, omniscient, eternal, and it is... It is not a situation in which God has given us a tool to use. He has given us communion, communion, 
co-union with himself. And as we talk about elevating it to that sense of reverence. So two challenging things that I've, I've challenged, I challenge myself with constantly. In scripture, you know, we talk about the day of Pentecost. We talk about the charismatic gifts. We talk, and, and that is sort of what I see wanting to be replicated on a regular basis in this style of worship. It, you, you, you want to carve out a 20 minute time frame add all of the dramatic effects necessary and recreate a Pentecostal experience in some way, shape, or fashion and, and have people absorb and go, whoa! But then what? Then what? Are we teaching as leaders in the church that 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 mountaintop, so to speak, is not where most of the New Testament exists. It's in the mundane, not the mountaintop. It's in the conversation with your children, who we were just talking about earlier. It's in your prayer life. It's in your anxiety and how you handle those things. It's in the decisions that you make on a daily basis. That's where the relationship, when I'm talking about it, that's what I'm talking about. That's where the relationship lies. That's where the power is because that's where he is in all and through all. You understand? So I'm, I, I'm hopefully am challenging individuals to how are you thinking about the Holy Spirit of God. How are you thinking about God in you? I want to read something. And there's several passages like this. I'm thinking of Romans 8. I'm going to bring out Romans 8 on Sunday. Here's Galatians 5. Galatians 5, I'll begin with verse uh, 13. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. That's a God heresy right there, right? We're free to sin because God forgives. Well, we don't, that's a related but separate issue. We're free to sin because God forgives. I'm forgiven. So Paul addresses that over and over and over again. All right? <laughs> Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are, hang on, always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Because you will destroy one another. And God, this is the weird thing about God's love. He loves you enough to allow that to happen. Because you can't turn to him with free love. You can't turn to him with, with open, um, open, our version of selfless love without free will. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Now, remember what he was just talking about before this. Sinning because we're forgiven. And setting God to the edges while I deal with my human relationships. He says, you'll destroy one another and you'll destroy yourself. He says, but there's a better way. Remember 1 Corinthians, now let me show you the best way to live. There's a better way, he says. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces, these two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. What does that mean? It means, I submit to you, Holy Spirit, speak to me. I want to do what you want me to do not for the sake of being or looking religious, not for the sake 
of being or looking good or being famous, not for the sake of being rich or any other worldly desire. Scripture, I want to submit to you and your will because I love you. And I know what you have done for me. And I am willing to trust you. I'm not going to get on the treadmill following the law of Moses. I'm not going to get on that New Testament treadmill of sin, forgiveness, pray, sin, forgiveness, pray, pray. What, what do I need to do next? I'm going to rest in the gospel of Jesus Christ and I'm going to trust. Holy Spirit, guide me in that because I know the world will constantly keep pounding on me. I need you. Does that make sense? There's a place below all of those other decisions that we can, that we can pull out this Holy Spirit or think we are and, and we can pull him out and use him to help make those decisions. There's a place even below all of that where we say, Lord, your will, not mine. And we actually mean it. Now, does any human being exist there? No, no, we don't exist there. But we want to intentionally move ourselves into that place and understand when we are out of that place. And we do that by the power of Holy Spirit. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Does that sound 2,000 years old? Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit in you produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading, now listen to this, in every part of our lives. Not 20 minutes on Sunday and not when we just think we need him to do something for us. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. So there we go. Let's bring the conversation home to how is Holy Spirit living in you, through you? How is he ministering on, on, on earth via you, your submitted vessel to him? So, anyway, uh, got to get rolling for this morning. I want to talk more about Holy Spirit tomorrow. Please, I didn't even read all of your questions, but this is a big topic, is it not? Is it not? Because this is something, again, that we can get wrong to our own detriment. And we can actually try to utilize the Holy Spirit of God to help produce the ends, right, of our sinful desires. Well, Lord, this, that, or the other thing. I know you love me, so give me this, give me that. Let me do this. And Lord's going, oh, did you not read your scripture? Did you not read, did you not read my word? What do you think of me? And in our worship experience, Holy Spirit teaches us, leads us in all things, including our worship and our understanding of the word. Is that where we are in our worship? Or do we try to artificially replicate a Pentecostal ex emotional experience and say, that's Holy Spirit. That's Holy Spirit. Look. 
right? How presumptuous. Can I just say this? And I know that a lot of people love this song, but I would never sing it. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. What an ignorant line to deny the sovereignty of God and to say you are welcome here. Now, I guess, you know, in a sense, it talks about our free will and our ability to block his will because we do not want his will in our lives. I suppose we could take that angle of it to sing, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Yeah. I don't know. Just my thoughts. doesn't matter. So, Father God, thank you. We want your thoughts. We pray that your Holy Spirit challenges us today to take us deeper in relationship with you. Not just seeking for those mountaintop stirring moments, but understanding your will for us in our everyday lives. What does that look like? What does that sound like? Where will you lead us? What would you have us do? What decisions would you have us make? How would you like us to grow and become? We submit ourselves to these answers. We trust you with your vision. In Jesus' name, amen. I can't wait to read all of your comments. Um, yeah, see, that's where I kind of went as well. Like, I understand that. I understand that. Boom. Dennis, always with an insightful remark. We can fabricate anything in our minds. It's a, it's a gift and it's a curse. So you guys take care. Try to have a good day regardless of the weather. I need to go say goodbye to my beloved who is heading off to work today. Um, I'll be back at the radio station this afternoon because we have to double up for a couple of weeks because we have vacations coming up. And so then uh, we'll be a couple of weeks where we won't be recording the program. So that's what we're talking about as well. Holy Spirit in our lives, what he looks like, sounds like, feels like, how he moves, how we address him. So take care, guys. I love you. Uh, like I said, share away. Feel free. Bye-bye now.